Okay, so if we're going back to the privacy bill, uh, you recall there are a couple of outstanding issues. Based upon hallway conversations, I just have it really seems very unlikely that we'll vote on this today. Uh, but hopefully, we can put things in motion so maybe when we first meet tomorrow morning, we can uh, uh, kick this baby out. Uh, the first thing was the, the issues that were outstanding I have was the audit. And I, despite the fact that I remember asking people to set this day aside to come back to us with uh, suggestions as to what should be in the audit, apparently due to vacations and stuff, that has not fully happened yet. Uh, so we'll get an update on where that is. And then there was the issue of uh, modernizing the biometric data, which you'll see on page three of this bill. And then we had the, the big issue was whether we were going to go with the California version, uh, and apparently many, many states already have this in place uh, to deal with how software companies and others deal with students in terms of privacy issues or a more, uh, I guess, expansive, what's called the compromise uh, uh, version. So, so PIPA 2. Uh, right. Right. Uh, we had tentatively agreed to go to so PIPA 2, two point I think. Um, I think we have. But David uh, sort of warned me that there was um, some issues in there that uh, industry people, uh, not industry people, but this was, the issue here was that SIPIPA 2 dealt with a sort of softer privacy information that might appear in a yearbook or stuff like that. And uh, it affected schools, and they will get into this, and school districts in terms of how much administration they would have to do. That set up the flags for me. I didn't understand that before. Uh, that might be an education committee issue. Uh, those are the kinds of people and witnesses we generally don't deal with. So I made a call to Senator Baruth, and he is very backed up in, at this particular point to take up that kind of issue in terms of what the administrative burden is. Uh, he is willing to take up this bill uh, next week and may sit on the calendar for a while to at least deal with the more traditional so PIPA issues in terms of industry being able to comport with the privacy issues, which are currently all reputable companies now have sort of come into compliance with and it would just be maybe protecting us against bad apples. So I think I should hear from David, that shouldn't be much of a problem that we could make that decision again now in this discussion. The fourth issue was uh, the issue of, if you recall, there was a, a lingering ISP issue as to whether or not we would ask the ISPs to maybe put some sort of statement on their form saying we do share data or we don't. Uh, Senator Brock, I think you thought I was just killing myself over nothing here because they have privacy policies but they're very hard to read and stuff like that so sort of backed away from insisting there because I got approached by industries like Comcast and other people saying we want to be heard if you're going to put that in and I said well we're not we're not the time to deal with this but there is one possible thing I'll suggest at the end of the committee is interested we might go down an even softer approach uh, on that. And the last thing was the breach, uh, which I have a suggestion here, I think, which is very short and sweet on page 13, which we will look at. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to David to walk us through uh, draft number 2.1. Okay. Um, <clears throat> For your record, David Hall, Legislative Council. Um, so this right now is crafted as a strike all amendment, committee amendment to S Bill 110, which you do have in your possession. Um, 
the changes relative to the last time you saw this um, are highlighted in yellow. It looks like you all have color copies, so that's yeah. good. Um, section one here, this is the issue of the privacy audit, audit and to whom it is committed. The change is to go to the Agency of Digital Services. Um, you've discussed whether it should be Chief Privacy Officer. You decided not to have yet the Chief Privacy Officer, and so right now ADS is the uh, nominal leader of this effort. And it seemed like it was a bit of a hot potato situation where nobody really wanted it. And so um, do, do we have a sense whether the Agency of Digital Services... They're here. They're here. And we will hear briefly from them in terms of... Great. Okay. Um, <coughs> how much they're going to want to do this. <laughs> okay. So right now, items one through seven, you can see, are the same. These are essentially the, the items from the report plus six and seven from the AG's original testimony. So uh, at this point, that's what they would be looking at. Now, were you here when we sort of left and people were to come together and give us their best thoughts on what should be in the audit? Do you remember that conversation? I was sitting right behind you. Okay. And what is your knowledge of status of that? I think they're still working. Uh, I think, I think, uh, Secretary Quick, you were to be involved in that, weren't you? And the AG's office were to be involved in that. Have you guys met at all? Uh, talked at all? We have not. Not yet. Okay. And who else was going to be involved? David, you, the three of you? Tanya. Okay. Tanya's here. Okay. Um, can you do that today? Because we're wanting to get the sound. We can talk today. Okay. Can you do it right after? Okay. We'll get you out of here early, and because I'd really like to, if possible, vote this out <coughs> tomorrow. And it still has a long way to go, but if we could just take this section one and improve upon it, we, the committee would be most grateful. Okay. Maybe you could convene in, in your office or something. I, I can't. What do you have to do? <laughs> well, everywhere. Okay. I, I have I have a meeting with another set of clients from 12 to 1. I have to testify from 1 to 3.30. Okay. Well, if these three, <laughs> if the substantive people could get together and pull together some ideas, we could get you some. Yeah. My, my understanding is just because they all have a hand in it, they were just going to basically reflect on whether or not these are the right things to look at in the audit. That's okay. the way they left it. So, okay. and if need be, we'll take more time. I know Senator Brock obviously would have an interest in this section. Um, so, if it gets delayed tomorrow morning again, so we. Uh, okay. So, on page two, we're now moved to this is the definition section that governs the chapter in which the, uh, the Data Breach Notice Act appears <coughs> and the very important uh, term there is PII, personally identifiable information. The recommendation from the AG study had been to uh, modernize this definition to expand things to include it, uh, biometric information, genetic information, health information, logging credentials, and passport numbers. So Pam Dixon had testified by phone later that um, she could offer a more thorough definition of biometric information. So the yellow language that you see here is essentially um, ref reflects what she offered. Um, <clears throat> I did send this to her. I have not heard it back from her. Um, but I know there was also some work outside the room by industry on looking at what a couple of other states to do. I, I have no idea who likes this definition and who doesn't. Um, I guess the one thing I'll note is that I do use the word includes here, and for purposes of our statutes, as you're likely well aware, includes denotes a non-exhaustive uh, list of examples that could constitute biometric information, but this is not the only stuff. And ultimately, you know, whether or not 
biometric information is implicated in a breach is up to both the company affected and to the AG's office as the enforcement uh, people on the subject matter. So that's all I have on that. Okay. Look at this uh, list of definitional information regarding biometrics come from? The yellow language? Yeah. Pamantics. Pamantics. World privacy forum. The woman who testified, remember, was such a whiz. Patterns of gain. Sleep data. That's privacy related. I mean, it's hard for me to envision these, this definition, quite frankly. Yeah, I think the trigger here is that whether it's the imagery or it's patterns or it's um, some other kind of data, it, it would be used singly or in combination to establish individual identity. So well, it would be sleep data sure. as, a, as, a, as an identifier. I mean, is that something that is generally accepted in the scientific community as a measure, as a biometric Identifier? I have no idea. Yes, I would yeah. like to have some idea if we're putting a definition into law that it's actually meaningful. I think we might hear from John Quinn. I think that the thrust here is that there, at this point, um, a lot of individually uh, identifiable patterns, such as your heartbeat, that distinguish one person from another. And so I think, like a again, friend? Yes, yeah, like your, heartbeats are your car knows, your BMW knows it's you by your heartbeat and won't start unless it's you. I, I don't know. The, the, the bottom line here, again, though, I want to underscore is that this is not the only list of stuff that could qualify as biometric information. But not limited to. Exactly. Right. So it could be any of these things and it could be a thousand more. That we haven't yet identified our individual, like all the giraffe spots are all just like our fingerprints. I hadn't and so as I said, if there were a breach of some sort of uh, data by a company and they were subject to this law, they would have to make the first analysis. Well, we lost this information about people. Does that constitute biometric information under Vermont's law? If it does, then we have a duty to report. I think that frequently happens in consultation with the AG's office, but not always. And then the AG's office will also have the duty if it chooses to enforce or not to enforce to say, you lost data, it constitutes biometric information under our law, you have a duty to report. Yeah, it's, tr it's a tricky, if you read the whole thing through, I mean, you could eliminate everything after line 18, and you might be le left with a more confusing situation, because it says it's physiological, biological behavior character can be used singly or in combination with each other or other identifying to establish individual identity. You can end it there, but we already have in law things like genetic information, health information. So I guess these are sort of new wave, new age kind of things that sort of fall into the same. Well, actually, they're all being currently used in some capacity, is my guess, as personally identifiable characteristics. So it's not, it's not exhaustive. Right. Gives you a good notion. Inclusive. It's inclusive. Which is what we try to be at home. <laughs> so that's it. That piece. The next piece, uh, starting with section three here, um, the saga of SOPIPA continues. Um, I think we've talked about SOPIPA a number of times, what it does as far as um, the prevention of targeted advertising, the collection of information and data. Uh, during the scope of a use of a particular educational product for K through 12 purposes. I'm sure that all rings a bell for you at this point. Um, as the chair indicated, the, the version that was offered subsequently uh, by Pam Dixon and I, I think, I don't know if I want to characterize as support or neutral by industry because it didn't really affect them, had this last component added to what would otherwise just be so people. And that was this putting this responsibility on schools to disclose in certain ways how it uses and disseminates student data, 
specifically directory type information, which is already addressed in federal law to some extent. This would have gone further. It would have required a certain kind of notice. It would have required it to make it available on its website. It would have required the option to pick and choose what data you wanted to, to, to release and not release and to be able to change that throughout the year. So as the chair indicated, I, I flagged for him uh, as your counsel a general concern that that would impose some burden on Vermont schools. I don't know what it is. Um, I don't know how the burden weighs against the benefits to privacy considering it's already addressed in some regard by federal law. So that was the flag that I raised on that piece. And I have sent this along to Senator Baruth and I have not heard back from him. I have spoken to him. So and his reaction was he also is, feels pressed for time. He has no time this week. He could certainly look at, I think it's Sam Calder, and he could look at the more common version of so Pippa uh, next week for a half hour, an hour, uh, get the players in if you wanted to, if you wanted to. He seemed less inclined. I said I would personally in looking at the broader version, but I would not do it unless he wanted to do it. Because I think, you know, those cast of characters, if you're talking about the NEA and the Superintendents Association, anybody else who might be affected by this is more in his bailiwick. Um, so I told him, you know, if you want to add it on, we'll look at that potentially. We have to look at it as an amendment, maybe a friendly amendment, but we're not going to do that here. That was an, an, a, a chair's position. If other people feel differently, that we could talk about adding that back in. If I may offer one more thing. And also, David did say that this would be the first of its kind in the nation uh, bill. So the language that came to you um, on that second piece of the proposal, I frankly have some concerns with the way it was written. I felt like some of the terminology was not consistently used. In <coughs> um, we can deal with that. True, but I, I, I did reach out to try to understand why some of the phrasing and some of the terms were used the way that they were, and so far I haven't heard back. So, so yes, Senator Clarkson. So to the end of the schools, expanding the school's responsibility, they, I mean, Sadly, they've assumed some responsibility in offering some of the software, uh, educational software, to students. So when you offer that, and in some cases the student might access that on their own, but mm -hmm. the school may also have uh, provided that software to the student. In such a case, they're already responsible. If they are responsible for enabling and providing access for that, software, they then should be responsible for how it's used and what its effect is on a student's life. Uh, maybe all true. I, I want to say here that part of the problem raised by tacking that last piece on to SOPIPA is that they're not really related except at the broad level of student privacy. So um, that whole piece about disclosure of the school's personal information about the students, that is independent of the use of the software for K through 12 purposes. So I think your comments are directed at that first piece. Uh, the second piece is not governed by the first piece. It really relates to how does the school disclose and to whom does it disclose directory information of students, uh, which again is covered by FERPA. Right. Um, whether and how you know families can opt out of that information, how they're supposed to receive that information, et cetera. So that's the that's the onus, that's the burden on schools relative to directory information. So Biba relates to what data am I collecting about you yeah, yeah, and I use your math builder program. So, so in some ways they actually already have that responsibility. Every school takes on you know deals with what it's choosing to disclose or not. <laughs> so that's true. So under the federal law, um, they have a duty to annually disclose 
how they manage your education records, who can see them. Um, they also have to tell you what they consider to be directory information and how you can opt out of its use. Um, Which is one step beyond FERPA, these provisions. That's kind of it. Right. They, the, 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 the federal law doesn't tell you how you have to do right. it, doesn't tell you when you have to do it, it doesn't even really say explicitly um, that they have to uh, make this rolling preference available to you. So this would be a Vermont layer on top of that. Right. Yeah. Which, so there was one other piece in there too, wasn't there about... Um, the general audience website in SOPIPA? Yes. Right. So, um, yes, at each step along this path, we've sort of flagged this one piece of the proposal that was present in the original California law and has been replicated in the many states that have brought it along. Um, and that was the exception of SOPIPA's application to the use of general audience websites, even if you had to use login credentials first to get find your way over the general audience website. So the question has always been, what does that mean exactly? What is the scope of that exception? In its most general terms, it's when you're using that K through 12 software, and then you find a link in that software that takes you out to Google or whatever. And at that point, the targeting, the data collection, the regulatory pieces don't apply to your use over here, even though it was a gateway to go from that software to the general audience website. So the question uh, has been, why do we have that exception? Why shouldn't your use when you're in this sphere also be governed by SOPIPA's protections? Um, at last hearing, the EG's office was going to talk to the industry about why they have the need for the exception, what it means, et cetera. So, has That's, there been any litigation over that at all, as far as you know? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, and has anybody gotten rid of the exception in other subject laws? I haven't looked at all 34 of them, so I, I don't know. But my understanding is okay. the majority, if not all of them, have okay, it. Okay, we'll hear from the agent and we can make some headway on that. Uh, let's move on. Sure. Uh, let's skip over the... ISP thing that I mentioned earlier. Right. Uh, and go just to the, I guess the last thing, is it just a breach thing? It is. It's the question of substitute notice. Um, Sorry, what page? We're on, it first? starts on page 12 at the bottom. Ah, so I have a question. So it's amending subdivision B6. The first component of that is direct notice which is required unless you can use substitute notice. That appears on page 13. And right now, they can use substitute notice if the data collector demonstrates the cost of providing written or telephonic notice to affected consumers would exceed $5,000 or the class of affected consumers to be provided written or telephonic notice exceeds 5,000 5, consumers um, or if they don't have sufficient contact information. So you'll see, obviously, the changes here. Uh, raising that threshold from $5,000 to $10,000 and eliminating the class of affected consumers. So it would all turn on uh, either the cost of direct notice or uh, the inability to uh, contact them because you don't have sufficient contact information. So you recall that the conversation we had last time, we were saying, you know, the, the balancing act here is just what is the burden on the business that yep. you know, right. has done the breach? And when we started talking about the new age of email, you know, there could be 50,000 people and it could be very inexpensive to do it. Once, once, so by putting email in here, that could lower the cost significantly and the $10,000 was admittedly arbitrary over time. Whatever was there before has grown with inflation. And I didn't see a need for the number. It was more the cost to people. The one thing I would say in here, David, yes. and maybe just think about it. I don't know if it's necessary. Could somebody read this number I1 and say, 
well, it cost me over $10,000 if I tried to mail everybody. And it says I have a choice of written email or telephone notice here. So therefore, I'm electing to do it in the paper. So it should be any one of those three, as opposed to them choosing which one they want. You follow what I'm saying there? It's a, sort of just a drafting kind of thing to make it clear that somebody can look at it and say, if I had to mail everybody a letter, it would cost me over $10,000. Sure. Even though I do have 90% of my people could be email, and it could cost me a lot less. I think you would want to say something like the uh, whichever is yeah. the least costly. Yeah, I, I understand. Okay. Uh, Ryan, can we hear from you? We're going to have to go to another bill in about five minutes. I'd like to hear from you. And then I, I don't know that I John, I need to hear from you today, but I want, I do want you guys to get together on that first section. And, uh, and, I, and I assume we will hear from you as to whether you think what the cost of this audit might be. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, yes. That's not a good sign, but. No, that's not a good sign. You've got to do this, don't you, John? He's ready to do it this summer. <coughs> he likes the test. We can give you more time. It costs us less. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to see a little comment. Do you want to do it? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to do it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Do we need to? So I think the first part, we could sort of move on if you guys are going to meet in the next hour or so. Let's see if you have any suggestions on that. Let's talk about some pitfalls. Sure. Um, and for the record, Ryan Crater with the Attorney General's Office. I'm Charity Clark, Attorney General's Office. Um, so as far as the SOPIPA part goes, uh, what I'd like to suggest is, as I understand it, the version in this is the original California law. Is that correct? So as, as I understand it, there's kind of, let's say there's three versions that we're looking at here. There's this version, the original California law. Then there is the enhanced version, which was negotiated between Pam Dixon and the industry folks and, and has so tweaks throughout. Just, just so to be clear on that, <coughs> when I hear the word, is that what you would be referred to as the compromise yes. negotiation? Correct. Well, what David has been saying to me <coughs> is that, for the most part, the industry has no interest in that. So who did they compromise with? Or who did they negotiate with? The third party should have been the schools rather than the industry. So, so what I'm what I was going on to say is the enhanced version also has those two extra sections that are the FERPA sections. The what? The FERPA, FERPA sections. Right. The school sections. Right. So what what I would recommend is that if the school sections are going to come out because the education committee right. doesn't have time for them. I would revert back to the enhanced version minus those two sections, not the California version. Okay. And that's, what is, that's what this is? Okay, great. So that. Now, as far as the, let me just speak to the school versions, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, um, we, we had three hearings with regard to uh, all of these. There was, so PIPA raised in all of those hearings, and we did. You know, we did actually reach out to, you know, agents of education. We did try to get those folks in, in the room. Um, did they get there? I can't remember. I don't recall the big. I think, I think the there may have been a presence in the final hearing. So, I mean, we, we weren't we were trying to bring all the stakeholders in. We did we did try to do that. Um, all I would say about those last two sections is, under FERPA, there are limitations on schools' ability to share this directory information that includes date of birth and. You know, information that parents and students might not want to be shared. And schools are allowed, as, as David explained, schools are allowed to share this information if they get consent. They have to alert the, um, the uh, parents. The issue, I think, why we have these two extra sections is if parents don't realize what their rights are under FERPA, then they don't exercise their rights under FERPA. So it's just as good as FERPA not existing uh, for that purpose of directory information. And the purpose of this was to allow, to enhance the ability of parents and students to know their rights to opt out of the sharing of that information. And the other part of it was that currently, some schools will take an all or nothing approach to opt out. So 
If you want to opt out of us sharing your directory information, you can, but then you can't be in the yearbook, which de facto means no one opts out because they want to be in the yearbook, which means, again, their rights under FERPA aren't really exercised. Right, so two things, just to keep us moving. Sure. One is that what you're describing seems to be, it, it, could, it sounds good policy-wise, <coughs> but it's gonna take a change in approach by the schools, and we haven't heard from the schools. And they may say, even though it's not great for parents, I don't want the added workload, or there is added workload. And the second thing is, I think the AG took no position on one or the other here. And now it sounds to me like you're taking a position. I, I just want to explain the, the value of those sections. I understand that they're coming out, and, and we may talk about that in, in the other committee and have that conversation. Is, is there some way we can accomplish that um, and actually educate parents better about FERPA without, you know, without necessarily going down the <coughs> fully down those two roads? I mean, is there isn't there something we could do in education? Could uh, do for a crossover. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, educate parents in all sorts of different ways. I mean, there, there, there may be other options, certainly. I mean, those have not been discussed at this stage. Um, so that, that's basically the SIPA okay. section. Um, what about the thing that David was talking about, uh, the exception? Oh, so my understanding is that we're talking about that one section that, that some some advocates had recommended removing. Um, and I do want to specifically refer to it. Uh, Can you help us find that? Uh, I think it's, think it's page 11, uh, 2443 F sub 3 line 10. Apply to general audience internet websites. So the position of the Attorney General's office is we, we, did, we did have a conversation with uh, the uh, industry advocates on Friday, they expressed their reasons why they think it needs to stay in. I'm not going to try to characterize their reasons. I don't want to mischaracterize them. Uh, we were of the opinion that the student privacy uh, interests seem stronger than the arguments we were hearing. However, this committee has not heard from them directly as far as their arguments. And if it were to take out, then that would make us singular as far as we know. I think every other state does have this section in there. It may be because the argument was had in California and it made it in and then it just kind of got replicated through. I don't know that that is a statement of the merits of it one way or the other, but it would put us in a different position vis-a-vis -vis all the other states. And that is, you know. Well, I for one apologize because I would like to explore looking at that exception, as I would like to explore the things about the parents. We just have not had time to do it. So it's frequently the case we've run out of time, and it's hard for us to bring something to the floor without having everybody heard. So, uh, certainly, completely understood. Um, I did want to note um, one other issue, just going back to the definition of PII, if you have a second. Yes. The definition of biometric, so this was a definition that um, Pam Dixon described to us as the gold standard. It was created by an academic somewhere. Um, but in, a, in that conversation on Friday, the industry folks said that they weren't in love with this definition. Um, if I recall, in the data broker bill for brokered personal information, there was a biometric definition. I believe this definition was the introductory definition, which was then negotiated into what ended up in the biometric, in the data broker bill. So one possibility, I think probably the easiest thing to do would be just to deal with it on the House side, and there'll be negotiations, and we'll, well change it. it, it but the goal is the same, and we just did it last year, unless there's been some changes, why don't you just use the one from last year? That's the other way to go, and, and I, I suggest that. that. Easily. Yeah, so it's probably a little bit more modern than that exists in current law here. And, and that would also be consistent across our we statute, that, which would be great. Uh, on the other hand, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of reluctant to leave the gold standard. I mean, it's it's 
It's a gold standard according to one aggregate. Yeah. Uh, it's I'll not a gold standard as far as definitions of, of in effect, dictionary yeah. definitions of definitions to look up. I, I think it goes too far, frankly. Right? No. Okay. So we're going to. Well, um, I, I would say that only if it wasn't all in current practice, but I would bet us dollars to donuts. Many of those are already happening. I hope that of all of these three things, we can get the message to Michael Morricone, I guess that's what he's yeah. yeah. That, you know, that frequently happens when bills cross over, you know, you do your first shot and then the other committee says we could do better. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to encourage that they look at these issues, continue to look at these issues and not that we rejected them as much as a time issue. Mm -hmm. yes. And in addition, I mean, that biometric argument happened in that committee last year. So, you know, they have some experience. Anything with the breach? Are you okay with that? Um, I mean, it seems, it seems like a reasonable change. I, I agree with your edit that it would want to be clear that the least <laughs> costly version right. was under 10,000. However, that would be done. Um, oh. Uh, one other thing I did want to mention that came up on Friday with regard to login credentials, including the username and password. There's been an argument that if you're talking about a data breach involving credentials, the notice really is a very different type of notice than all the other kinds of breach. What a lot of states have done is for a credential breach, they've almost created kind of like a separate subsection for that kind of breach. Because basically, if you have a username and credential breach, um, usually what they do is the next time you log in, they say you need to change your password because there was a breach. It's just a different, but it only makes sense. And also, for example, you don't want to notify people about their need to have a credit report run if you lost your username and credentials. It's a totally different animal. So again, I, I wouldn't let that hold up us here. That could be a discussion that happens on the other side. Good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So tomorrow we'll talk about some time to finish this up and we'll hear from John. Hopefully they'll have language for us on the audit and we'll, you know, depending on how reasonable John is and his money request, we can put money in or not. <laughs> money could be. Just teasing. So um, we'll see you guys tomorrow morning. Kayla will be in touch with you and hopefully all of you can meet right now and see if you want to change any of that language on the first section. We'll do. Thank you. Uh, 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 uh,